So good morning and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we have got uh, uh, a session for you on cornea and it's called corneal common corneal procedures in clinical practice. The emphasis is on skills which you should have to do the procedures and the knowledge as to why you do it and why things work and don't work. So these are my declarations of interest and uh, that's what we're going to call this today, like I said, and we are going to give you quite a few of them. We've got six things we're going to cover in two hours. Uh, if we run out of time, then we might drop the last one or two, but hopefully we'll cover most of these. And I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Dr. Dalia Said. She is a consultant ophthalmologist and associate professor of ophthalmology with the University of Nottingham, where I work. She's a colleague from the same center. And we have Rashmi, who is, uh, Rashmi Deshmukh, who is uh, a clinical research fellow in Nottingham. She was an LV Prasad Eye Institute fellow and has come to spend a year with us in Nottingham. So they will be covering a topic each. Let's start off with the first one, corneal lacerations. All of us, no matter what specialty we work in, will see patients in the emergency who've had a corneal problem, and sometimes some of us will actually cause the lacerations because of what we do uh, during the course of other procedures. So this can be due to a sharp instrument, or it could be blunt, and it could be with an inorganic or organic material. Why is it common to know, or important to know whether it is inorganic or organic material, or blunt trauma, or sharp, because the associated collateral damage can be variable, whether it's a very sharp instrument, then it may be just the cornea and not the rest of the eye. If it's a blunt trauma causing a laceration, uh, there is a combination of a lot of damage to other structures at the back of the eye as well as the cornea. Inorganic material usually is associated with uh, infection risk, very high fungal, whereas organic material, which is plastics or metals, tend not to. So you have to keep that in mind. And it can be penetrating or non-penetrating, and this I will show you in a minute what that means. Um, whether the trauma was clean trauma or was it, it contaminated, again, uh, very important, the rule of thumb is that all patients with trauma, you must start prophylactic antibiotic therapy. And if there are bits of the eye, lashes, or bits of the lid, or other bits of debris, then they have to be considered and cleaned and removed. So history of what, when, and how is very important. And in our situation, we always ask for tetanus immunization if there's a record. If not, if in doubt, we give them a booster for tetanus. And one of the things which uh, you can be asked is to, patients got a large epithelial defect and a laceration, will you put anesthetic drops? Because anesthesia slows down the healing. And the answer is yes, of course. And this is particularly true in chemical trauma. There's blepharospasm sometimes. There is a lot of pain and irritation. The patient will not let you examine the eye if you don't put a lot of topical anesthesia and get rid of the pain. So you must instill anesthesia to undertake a complete and thorough examination. And then coming to the specifics of the trauma, we have to examine the entire extent of the, the wound just get this here. So it's, it's very, very important to know. And if, uh, as we'll see in some images, the wound is extending up to the limbus, then you have to explore the sclera on either side. You must know your materials. So you're going to clean this wound, you're going to examine this wound, then you're going to start to close it, which is the, the, the main title of the talk is how do you suture these lacerations. Every needle, uh, and there are many different kinds of needles, many different sizes, it has these components part, every needle. It has the, the swage, which is this back circular part into which the thread is clamped shut, so it's an eyeless needle, as we all know. Then you have the needle body, which is usually flat, and then you have the needle point. And this can be side cutting, it can be reverse cutting, or it could be uh, round and you can have various designs but 
what we prefer for cornea is the flat or the spatulated side cutting with a sharp point. You don't want a, uh, a reverse cutting needle. You don't want a sharp edge to the back of the needle because when you pass it through at a certain depth, it will probably go deeper and make a, a cut in the cornea which is uh, vertically uh, higher or taller than, than you intended. So where the needle starts to become flat, that is just beyond the swage of the needle is where you will hold it with your needle holder. Uh, if you hold it in the round part, it will be swiveling in your needle holder. Very important to hold it where the needle becomes flat. And, and uh, this, in, in practical terms, your 10O monofilament nylon needle, Alcon, Ethicon, all of them make it the 10O monofilament nylon needle. And the, the if it is double armed, then this, the uh, the needle that comes with the double arm is better than the one that comes with a single arm, and I'll tell you why. So, non-penetrating lacerations. Now, you get a patient like this, and what you have to do is, you have to see this wound is going all the way here to the limbus. So you have to do a peritomy, expose the sclera, there will be hemorrhage, there will be edema, you will not be able to see whether the sclera is affected or not. So any wound that goes up to the limbus has to have a peritomy to explore the sclera adjacent and how far the wound has gone. Then you lift it up, and this patient was actually referred two days after the injury with three or four lashes in the wound. That's a no-no. You have to clean it. You can tell from the edema how long this wound has been there. It's already become hazy. And then you clean it and you put it back into place and stroke it into place. And because this is a swollen wound and not a LASIK flap, it will not stay by itself. You have to give tacking sutures. Now these tacking sutures have no rules. They are, you can just put them anywhere. They're very superficial sutures. But the important thing is that you have to align the extremity of the wound first. If, le if that falls into place at the limbus, then the rest will fall into place and it will have to be kept like you can see over here and then when all the sutures are removed there is just a, a very faint line over there of the scar but the rest has fallen into place at the worst this patient will have some um, uh, irregular astigmatism and we have to then try and treat that with a, with a contact lens uh, and after you've done this not to forget the antibiotic cover these patients must be given and you can put a bandage contact lens on the top. These knots are buried but if you don't want to bury them you must have a bandage contact lens because they are going to come out very soon. Now if you see something like this, now this is again a non-penetrating corneal laceration. Some of you may remember ha leaving your book on the window and it's rained and the book pages get wet, they open up. You can never push that book back normal again. In the cornea, the same happens, but it goes back to normal on its own. One important thing I'm going to draw your attention to here is this part of the wound. It's not so important in the non-penetrating wound, but the line joining one extremity of the wound to the furthest extremity away is called the hinge. Just like a door or a window has a hinge where it opens and closes, this line is the hinge, and we'll come back to that concept. You see this very nicely in retroillumination, this hinge. So when you see a wound like this, do nothing. Just give antibiotic drops. The endothelial pump will cause the edema to settle, and everything will fall back into place. You don't have to give tight sutures to try and squeeze it back into place. So if it is a non-penetrating laceration like this, let it be and it will settle as you can see everything goes back into place quite nicely. Penetrating lacerations, completely different ball game. So here, when you look at this laceration, and you've done all the other things, you've examined the eye thoroughly, et cetera, now you started to suture the cornea. The first thing you ascertain is the site of entry of the object into the front of the cornea, the epithelium, and the exit into the endothelium. So where it has gone, so look at the profile of the injury going through the cornea. Where it entered the epithelium, where it entered the AC through the endothelium. Having done that, and you can draw this on a piece of paper or imagine it in your mind as you're looking at the patient, then you draw this line joining the two extremities, which is the hinge. 
if that hinge is within your drawing, it is a self-sealing wound. You don't have to suture it. If that line is outside the area of the wound that you have drawn, like you see here, it is going to leak and you need to put sutures. Now, imagine your cataract wound where you don't put any sutures ever if it is a properly constructed wound. Any line joining one corner of the cataract wound to the other is within the area of your cataract wound. It is a self-sealing penetrating injury of the cornea and it will heal by itself. So that is exactly what happens if it is a traumatic um, laceration as well and or iatrogenic like I said we produce often. Now here's an example of a thorn injury and if you look at that penetrating injury and if you look at the trajectory of that wound from the epithelium all the way to the endothelium there, but if you draw a line from here to here, it is all that hinge would be within the wound. And here you can see there's leaking, but all you do is nothing or you put a bandage contact lens and put antibiotic drops and it'll heal and it'll seal by itself. The only difference here is that if you have hot metal and a hot metal goes through the cornea, it actually causes collagen shrinkage around it. And that hole is now different because the collagen has shrunk. And even though the hinge is within it, it may take a long time to seal by itself or it may not. And there you have to then put something else and Dr. Uh, uh, Said will show you. But here you are the same patient, see fluorescein there, no leaking, it is self-sealed. Here, another patient, you can see a triangular wound, it's leaking profusely, this hinge, which is over there, is outside the wound and you have to put your sutures. So what are the principles of suturing? Most important is that your suture should be perpendicular to the site of application, and then the distance between two sutures should be less than the length of your suture. If the distance between two sutures is more than the length of your suture, it will leak in between over there. And you would then have to put another stitch over there. The, the length can vary, uh, usually closer to the limbus, they are longer, and as you move to the center, they are shorter, the sutures, but you can, you can vary the distance between the sutures according to the length that you are using. <coughs> now this is an uh, example of how a corneal suturing should not be done. Uh, this was one of my medical retina colleagues who was on call and he did things. So you can see the direction of the sutures, not all are perpendicular to the wound, the size is different, the distance between them is different, and quite importantly, some of the knots are actually buried in the wound. So when you suture cornea, whether it is a graft or whether it's a laceration, never bury the knot in the wound. And the reason is that because one day you have to take that stitch out and when you pull the knot in the wound, if it is there, that wound will break open like this. It will either go an internal dehiscence or the whole thing will rip apart. So the knot is the one that's the most difficult to pull out. Therefore, bury it in the uh, outs either side of the wound, wherever you prefer, but not within the wound. So again here, as you can see, applied perpendicular, app they don't have to be parallel to each other. It is just applied perpendicular to the point of application work your way from the attached part of the wound towards the center. So always suture from the extremities towards the center, not from the middle of the wound, which you think you're going to suture in the middle and then outwards. And the reason for that is here. If you get the middle wrong, even by a fraction of a millimeter, that whole alignment will never fall in place. If you get it slightly wrong, by the time you reach the edge, there will be a fish mouth, which will constantly leak. So always start from the edge, those points are the closest, you will get it right, or the chance are most that you will get it right. When you stitch that, then the fixed points are moved internally. Then when you put another suture next to that, they move, and, and that way the whole wound falls into place. So it is good to start here and here, and then move your way in. Now, look at the profile of the wound. If the profile of the wound is straight, then you go equidistance on the two sides with your suture from the edge of the wound and you get the right compression force to oppose the wound without slippage. If it is an underriding and overriding edge, like here in an oblique wound, it is easy to get the wound to slip. So what you want to avoid that by the way you place your sutures, you want it to join back like this and not like this. 
So what you would do is, it's very important that the distance from the edge on the underriding part of the wound is further away than on the overriding, so you get the right compression to bring it together. If you look at the forces that are applied, it is also uh, written, and, and probably rightly so, that if you take the internal edge, the internal part of the wound as a center, you could then probably place your sutures that uh, uh, ar around that point rather than around this point, and you can get uh, equal compression. But this is what I follow, go further away from the underriding edge and closer to the overriding edge. Triangular wound, the rules change. In a triangular wound like this, the axis of the suture is directed not perpendicular as you see here, but towards the base of the triangle to get the right compression. If it is a very sharp apex to the triangle, you put an overlay suture. If it is not a sharp apex, you can put a suture there. And if it is a stellate wound like this, then you can put multiple suture always starting from the attached part or the extremity of the laceration working towards the center. And inside here, you can pass a running stitch through the stroma all the way and bring it out of the wound, tighten it, and then you can roll it away from the wound. And usually this one is completely buried and you don't take it out. If it is still leaking, then this thing here is to remind me to tell you that you take a piece of cyanoacrylate or take a bit of cyanoacrylate glue or a fibrin glue and again, uh, Dr. Syed will tell you much more about that. Now, looking at the depth of the wound, how far will you go? So if you go like that, 80% of the depth, then along and like that. Now, it's very difficult to get right angles in the, in the passage of your needle because it's a curved needle, but you go vertically straight down, turn it around, move along, and don't start directing it towards the, the surface right as you start past. Move it along flat and then turn it up and you will get this mattress effect. If the wound has a disparity in the host, and by this we see often in coronal grafts, not really a laceration, but it's a very important point to mention here, then always align the wound at the surface, not internally. So any disparity in the wound, you transpose that to the back of the cornea, not the front of the cornea, and then you will pass deep suture over here, but you will bring it out shallow comparatively speaking, it over there, so that that wound will align like that. If you put that suture right down here, it will pull this part of the tissue of the cornea down and you get a step over there. That's not what you want because that will then cause a lot of epithelial healing problems and also change the anterior curvature, which is quite important in refraction. If you go very deep, and we have now been able to show that if you go through the pre layer or through the desmets membrane, you get this crow's feet type of feel. If you keep your suture anterior to desmets membrane, so go 80% depth, like I said, you will not get these three, and sometimes these can be very annoying if they've gone right into the center of the pupil. If you have tissue loss, if you have tissue loss, then uh, there's a different uh, problem, or if you have an iris prolapse, then what do you do? The, the Classic teaching is excise any iris that is prolapsed because it has a risk of infection if you push it back in. But what I will tell you to do is clean it, and if it is not a contaminated wound, if it was a sharp metal injury and the patients come to you within a day or even 48 hours, I would be looking at more importantly the viability of that rather than the, um, the, the uh, uh, risk of infection. So. If you touch it and it's bleeding, that means it's still viable, you can push it back in the eye. If it is not bleeding and it's necrotic, then there's no point putting it because it's only going to cause inflammation. Use a lot of Helon if you want to um, create, uh, recreate the anterior chamber, and then uh, you, so if, if it's a collapsed anterior chamber and the cornea is not in its normal curvature, you pass your sutures, then fill with BSF before you tie it, uh, because then you'll get it the acquisition in the right shape. Otherwise, if it's flat and you, you get a very flat uh, shape. So get the shape right when you're finally tying the knot. And these are some examples of uh, sutures. Um, when you take the sutures out, you have a situation like this, a very scarred looking cornea. Uh, an important point which you may or may not know is that when you have very irregular cornea or very high refractive errors, the pinhole does not give you the true visual potential. 
you have to put a rigid gas permeable lens on the eye for any kind of base curve. Any, you want it to sit on the eye just for two minutes or less and then give the pinhole. So RGP pinhole vision for cornea surgery is a very, very important, very simple, but very important concept. You neutralize the curvature of the cornea or the irregularity of cornea with the rigid lens, then give a pinhole, you get very good improvement of vision. You know this patient has good potential. So here are some other examples of suturing. Uh, they don't always come classic triangles. So there's a triangle with a spur uh, and you suture that. This is a very, very badly traumatized eye and uh, had to suture it and then put a keratoprosthesis. We get the VR surgeons to sort out the internal of the eye and uh, the, the retina and then the cornea. Uh, here is one with a bone arrow injury. You can see there's another s uh, direction spur. So you treat what you can according to the principles and then, then treat the side arm separately. But you can get a reasonably good outcome at the end. And here again, before rushing to a cornea transplant, I would put a contact lens. And if the contact lens improves the vision, then that is the treatment for this patient. And I like I was saying, if there's tissue loss, then you can do this um, a patch graft. And here are some examples of a patch graft. Uh, uh, so you, you will sometimes put a cornea over the sclera and the cornea. And then later on, you come and repair that with a, a, a full thickness graft to get sight back to the patient. So basically, the trephination over the sclera is partial thickness to the cornea is full thickness that the cornea then with the endothelium intact, the donor button four millimeters or five millimeters, then rests in that uh, like you see over here. So this is your scleral side of the trephination. This is the corneal side of the trephination and you bring the whole cornea and you put it in like that. And because the sclera is thicker, usually it will fit in and then you stitch it into place. So take home messages, follow the principles of suturing. They make a difference. Do not debride stromal tissue. This I didn't mention, if there are multiple lacerations, like in the skin, you will cut out excess tissue. Never do that in the cornea. Put all of them back into place like a jigsaw puzzle. The moment you debride uh, even a little sliver of the corneal stroma, the sutures have to be tightened too much to bring that together and you end up with a lot of astigmatism. So that's important. Extro explore the extremities in the sclera, very important. Start suturing at the extremities and move centrally. Do not bury the knot in the wound. And remember, glue if you come unstuck. If there's a leak, despite your sutures, and again, uh, I think at that point, it would be good to, and I'm not going to talk about corneal grafts here because we're talking only about laceration because the principles of corneal graft suturing are very similar to what I've mentioned. And at this point, uh, I will stop. And then uh, what we'll do is, um, whether we have uh, um, time for questions now. We can take two or three questions if anybody wants to clarify any bit they haven't. We'll move on to a completely different topic, which is corneal gluing. So we, we won't defer questions till later. Anybody wants to ask anything? Now is the time on sutures. Any questions for Professor Dave? No. Okay, let's let's move on to corneal gluing. And it's a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Said yeah, now. There's one, one question here. There. Right. Yeah. You can use the microphone. Sir, the length of the sutures should be same from periphery to the midway or sh uh, it should be different? So, so the length is the vertical height, right? And at the periphery, they should can be they can be longer. So the longer they are, the fewer you have to the, you can put them further away. Therefore, the fewer you have to put. But as you move towards the center and towards the visual axis, you tend to make them smaller. So you have to make them closer to each other, because the distance between the smaller sutures will obviously be smaller. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Excuse me, sir. Can I have a question? Sure. Okay. By the time. Uh, what can we do in a zigzag tear? Sir? In a zigzag tear. Zigzag tear, sir. Irregular. A tier. zigzag tear. So yes. So you you treat each component as to what it is. In a zigzag tear, it is um, uh, you have anatomical points which you can ap approximate. You know, if it's an apex 
and a line and an apex and a line. It's like multiple short triangles. When you line the apex to apex and it falls into place, uh, you will suture at the extremity, get the different apex points together. Alignment is very important. And when you can get the alignment right that way, then you can put in your other sutures. Dr. Dua, just a question. You mentioned somewhere in the beginning of the talk that the double arm sutures, the needle is better. Oh, yes. As so compared, yeah, I think you forgot. Yes, to yes, sorry. Yes, thank you for reminding me that. So um, it, it was all, I would cover that in my bit on the corner. So you have to bury the knots. When, you, when you've done your suture, you have to bury the knots. And if you're burying the knot, the the width of the needle that comes with the double arm suture is a little wider than that comes with the single arm suture. So it's much easier to bury the knot if you have a slightly uh, wider thing. And the other thing you will notice, which is something which has never been written in any book, I have never published it, but I've said it in all my talks for the last <coughs> five years, is when you're trying to bury the knot, some knots go in very easily, some knots don't. And the reason for that is so simple, uh, once you know the principle, uh, it is easy to understand, is that if you're, s um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Before my next talk, I'll show you the diagram and I'll tell you how to make it very easy to bury the knot. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dalia Said. I work in Nottingham with Professor Dua. Uh, my first time in India, it's really my pleasure and honor to be here today. So I'm going to speak to you today about conventional and unconventional uses of cornea gluing. So we all know that there are two types of cornea glue, the cyanoacrylate based, which is a synthetic glue, and the fibrin based, which is a biological glue. So first I'm going to speak about the cyanoacrylate glue. It hardens by polymerization, so initially it is liquid. Once it gets in contact with tissue, because of the water content, it becomes hard. It has also an advantage that it prevents collagenase activity, so it helps to reduce melting in melting corneas. And it is bacteriostatic against some gram-positive organisms, but not gram-negative, so it can also help in managing the infections. But it is not biocompatible, so eventually you'll have to you remove it or it will fall out, and we will speak about when to remove it later. So we use uh, cyanoacrylate glue in perforations less than three millimeters or dismester seals if you think it's going to leak. And corneal melts, uh, also you can use that and wound uh, leaks. So that's an example of the size of a, a corneal perforation that you will use cyanoacrylate for. And if you have a dismester seal, and how do you know whether it is leaking or not? You make a very, very thin slit beam, and you can see that the AC is flat, so that's one very good tip. Also, the eye will be soft. And then, then you put 2% fluorescein. Remember, if it's a diluted fluorescein, you won't see the CEDL test, but if you put 2% fluorescein and look with the blue filter, you will see the leak. And sometimes there is a leak, and you cannot see a positive CEDL test. And that will be because the AC is almost flat, so there is no aqueous to come out. So remember that if you use a soft eye and you see the negative, just press a little bit on the eye and you will see the leak. Because if it's a flat AC, there is no aqueous to come out. So you will not get a positive seedle. 
And this is an example the, of a case before doing a therapeutic graft where it had also leaks. And because the eye is so soft, you'll not be able to terfine. So you have to seal the areas of perforation with glue before you terfine because you want a firm globe. And that's then after that we went and did the therapeutic grafts. So again, sometimes with these perforations, if it's been there for a while, you can get choroidal detachment. And if you get choroidal detachment, the AC will not form while you're doing your penetrating graft. So in this case, you have to do a little bit of scler sclerotomy and uh, remove the choroidal detachment so that the AC can form. Again, this patient is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who's had cataract surgery by one of the colleagues and came two weeks later with a central perforation and leak. So remember with rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes the eye is very dry and you can get from the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, corneal leak. And this is the one of the residents has gone and glued that patient and you can see how much excessive glue is there and that the, she's not removed or only the um, fibrin or, or any of the discharge. So the patient has a lot of inflammatory action. Can you see these inflammatory spots after we had to treat very aggressively with antibiotics and steroids. And that part remained not clearing at all. So we were thinking, is this infection under the glue that is not settling? But once we've removed the glue completely, there was nothing, no infection under. So that was just a bit of discharge that was left underneath the glue. So remember always when you're doing gluing to remove any discharge from underneath and around and any epithelial debris because the glue won't stick and you don't want anything sticking under the glue. Again, if you use corneal gluing in a case of infection, you have to be wary because we do put a bandage contact lens on top and sometimes your antibiotic will not penetrate very deeply with a bandage contact lens in. So you have to monitor the infection because it can get worse and if it does, you have to remove the bandage lens. And it's very, very useful to put a very thin layer of glue and I'll show you how to do that because if it's rough and you have to take off your contact lens, then the lid movement will dislodge it. So again, this is a CDL positive test and, and this is the patient where we, put a band, uh, where we put a glue, we put a bandage lens and look here, the patient developed infection. So you have to really monitor the patients if you're putting glue and putting a bandage lens. So this is what we need to do a cornea gluing. We need the spears, we need the cyanoacrylic glue, we need either uh, chloramphenicone ointment or uh, maybe uh, uh, some gel. And these biopsy punches, they come in different sizes, two, three, four millimeter. And we usually use a three millimeter if we're doing a single patch. And then we can use the 3M or any other drape, which is the non-sticky part of the drape. And this is how you do this. These are the biopsy punches. So we take a spear and we cut it. And when you're cutting a spear, don't use a scissor because the scissor will uh, crush the edge of the spear. So you actually need a sharp blade, so a 10, 11 millimeter or 25 uh, or 15 millimeter blade, and you cut the spear, then you take a bit of ointment, put it on the top, and you take the biopsy uh, punches and cut the plastic, and you have a plastic disc. So pi you pick up the plastic disc and put a tiny bit of glue on top of it. And that's an example of the video will show you exactly how we do this. So here is the, uh, this is the 11, uh, degree bra blade cutting flush and flat the spear and this is the uh, drape that we use you know the non-sticky part of the drape any drape will have a sticky part and a non-sticky part and with a rotating movement with your two fingers you rotate the um, biopsy punch and you'll have here then inside it the drape which is plastic as well as uh, the uh, paper, you don't use the paper, just use the drape. And you put a tiny bit of gel or chloramphenicol just to help you take the uh, uh, plastic and put it on the um, stick, which is you've created. Then put a tiny, tiny bit of glue. See, if you see the glue, it's too much. So if you, it's, you see blue, it's too much, and you can use the edge of the spear to remove the excess because you don't want to put excess glue. And this is how we do it. We have to remove completely the epithelium and stick the glue. Again, this is a video to show you this. So I'm removing all the epithelium has got to be removed. Any loose epithelium, the glue will fall out. So remember that even if you're making your epithelial defect bigger, don't worry because you have to remove any loose epithelium. And very quickly you put 
the glue and immediately it will start to polymerize because of the fluid inside the tissue. And then you will see the AC forming in front of your eye and then you check with fetal test and put your bandage lens. And this is an example of satisfactory glue application. Can you see this, just a disc and the, the, uh, the advantage of that plastic disc is that it makes the glue flat on the surface, so now not a raised areas in between which will be very uncomfortable uh, for the patient. Like in example, this is excessive glue and you can see the glue is sticking out from everywhere and that is very, very irritating for the patient and it, it will cause a lot of vascularization as you can see here. So when do you remove the glue? That's the question that we always get asked. So usually by two months time, you start to see vessels coming around the disc and underneath the disc. Once you've seen the vessels coming, you know that the glue is ready to be removed. So what you do is in your clinic, you take a forceps and nudge the edge of the disc. And if when you're nudging the disc is coming out, then you know the glue is ready to be removed. Then you just hold with the tying forceps and lift the glue and it will come out. If it's not coming out, then it's not ready to be removed yet. And see here, the vessels are coming underneath and coming around the disc. Then you know the glue is ready to be removed. And then after, after you remove the disc, sometimes you find an epithelial defect underneath it. It does, don't worry because it will close very quickly. And even if it's very thin, don't worry. As long as you have an epithelium on top of the cornea, that cornea is safe. And this is an example of the patient that was being glued. And you can see here it's very, very thin, but it's epithelialized, so we're not worrying about this patient. Now what if you have uh, such a big perforation like this? This is too big to glue, but if you have a smaller one with an iris prolapse, then you don't want the glue to come in contact with the iris. So what we'll do is the double drape technique, which has been published by Professor Drua. So here example where the iris is sticking out from your perforation. Yeah, so what you do is you take a small plastic disc, two millimeter, and put it on the iris. That does not have glue. And then get a bigger one, which is about four millimeter, which has got the glue in it, and stick it right on top. So in that way, the iris is not in contact with the glue. So this is, if you imagine this is the iris, then this is a small plastic disc to cover the iris, and a bigger plastic disc with the glue, which will then seal the perforation, but not stick to the iris and irritate it and cause more inflammation. This is a video which will show you this technique. So here, um, just removing all, uh, here you can see quite uh, briskly, all the epithelium is being removed. So you can see here, just scraping more and more epithelium. I put some uh, air here to prevent the iris from coming out then this is a s just a small plastic disc without glue, and this is the bigger plastic disc with the glue. And you can see it's very nicely flat on the cornea and very little glue sticking out, and then you can put your bandage contact on it. You can glue at the slit lamp if you're in a busy clinic. I used to do that when I was in Egypt. And here is a perforation that you can see, see the positive. You can use the sticks, the fluorescein sticks, to show you exactly where the area of perforation and use, uh, somebody can help you by just stick, uh, uh, sticking the leads up away from each other, but the and then you can just brush completely, dry completely, and you have to be very accurate if you're doing it at the slit lamp, because when you do it at the slit lamp and if you put excess glue, then it becomes very difficult to remove that glue from the patient when, while he's sleeping. So now we're going to speak about fibrin glue. So the fibrin glue is called the tissel solution. It's formed of two components, the tissel solution and the thrombin solution. The acrotinin is the only component that will prevent fibrinolysis, but at the same time, it can cause anaphylaxis. Very, very rare, but it can happen. And how does it work? So the uh, fibrinogen, uh, which is present in the tissel solution, become into soluble, then insoluble fibrin in the presence of thrombin, which is the other component of the fibrin glue. So it has a two components in the presence of uh, factor eight and calcium. And it uh, appears like honey, so when it polymerizes, it appears like honey, and it hemostatically has the tensile strength of a fibrin clot. So once you put the fibrin glue, it starts to set in one minute. You've got three to five minutes for it to solidify, so you've got some time to manipulate it in the tissue. It reaches 70% in 10 minutes, and it can 
be full strength in two hours and it's there for about 10 to 14 days. So this is an example where we use fibrin blue in uh, pterygium surgery. So now we don't do any sutures. We don't use any sutures for uh, pterygium. We always use fibrin blue. So here we've removed the pterygium and we've put our marks on the conjunctival graft that we're using, taken off the conjunctival graft, put it on its back, so stromal side up on the cornea, and then we use the thin uh, components. This is, it has two components, thin and thick. So the thin, just few drops and the thick in the bed. And then, uh, or you can do it the other way around, thick on the uh, graft and thin in the bed. And you, f you have time to flatten it. Use always two forceps, tying forceps to flatten it. And you can also use the fibrin glue to seal your tissue. Remember also always to uh, connect this conjunctival edge to the conjunctival graft that you've put. And here it takes very, very few minutes and it's all done. And we use this very often in pterygium surgery, no more sutures, no more removal of suture. Remember the suture is a needle for inflammation, so it will invite more recurrence. So that's why this technique with fibrin glue is been very useful. And here you can see it's completely 24 hours post. It swells a little bit, then it settles the blood dial down after the reperfusion of the blood vessels. You can also use fibrin glue when you're doing a multilayer amniotic membrane. So you put a tiny bit of fibrin between the layers, but that we usually tend to suture the more soft layer. And here you can use fibrin glue, very useful in epithelial growth. So this patient had four times epithelial ink growth. So that was the fourth recurrence. And here you can see that we're removing all the epithelium from the bed as well as from the back of the flap, as well as from the edges, right? Completely remove it. And you can even use vision blue to sh help you visualize the any remaining epithelial cells. And you scrape off all the epithelial cells then you put 70% alcohol for 15 to 30 seconds to kill any remaining epithelial cells. And then you put your mitomycin 0.02% for another 12, 15 minutes, both on the edges of your beds as well as your uh, flap. And then you put the fibrin glue all throughout the interface, not just at the edge, so that it completely occludes that, uh, that space that we've created with LASIK and then you put a bandage lens. And you can see that patients have uh, got uncorrected vision of 675 post-op with no more recurrence. Also, it is very useful when you have a mis mismatch between the graft and host. So when you're doing penetrating grafts and you have mismatch between the graft and host, the uh, bed is very irregular and you will get a lot of uh, leaks between your sutures because your host is irregular. And this is an example of a case where uh, uh, the host was very irregular, so I'm taking sutures, and the more you take sutures, the more it will leak next to it. Uh, so, and, and because of the ir very irregular host. And more and more sutures are taken and replaced sutures and still leaking. So what we did is, uh, then we've, this is one more suture I was trying to put, but again, as you can see, more leak, because it was very, very thin host. So you put the fibrin glue, the thick component first, and some of it will go into the anterior chamber. Don't worry about that because it will make a little clot, just like a fibrin clot, which will dissolve in two, three days. So don't worry about it. So we put thick, then the thin in the graft host junction, and some of it will go into the anterior chamber. Don't worry about it, but it will seal completely. And then uh, we've used that so many times. Now, if you have any excess threads like this, you have to cut it with a vanna scissor. Don't pull, because if you pull, you're going to pull the whole glue even out from the graft host junction. So again, also if you have a very thin bed, if you remove sutures, you can still leak from the suture tract. And in that case, you also put fibrin glue and it will seal these, seal these holes. You can't really suture these holes. So the only way to actually manage these holes is to glue them with fibrin glue. This is another patient who had a metal injury and that metal injury was taken out and then uh, fibrin glue was used to seal the defect. So this is the video. Here is the metal being taken out, foreign body, very brisk leak. So the wound was flushed with VSS and 
uh, you can see here very brisk rounded horn so So both the components of fibrin glue were injected in the crack, but it still had leak. So we had to put each component separate in the crack. So you put the thick, then the thin uh, in the crack. And again, oh. any excess fibrin you can remove. Just move on to the next slide, huh? yeah. or, or you go out of uh, outside outside of slideshow and then play it. You'd yeah. probably fail. Okay. Here again, sorry about that. So you can see the, the front body is removed, the wound is flushed, and it's very brisk. Good flow is seen, very brisk leak. You can see coming out from the AC. Always do a parson thesis because you never know when you'll need it. We didn't need it in this case, but it's good to put it. Then we tried with the cannula to inject both the thick and thin components together, but it still leaked. So you can see here there is still leak even though we've injected some fibrin glue in the wound. So then we took a 30 gauge needle and you inject a little bit in the stroma and into the AC, the thick and the thin components separate. So you can see here the thick, then the thin components separate a little bit into the stroma and some of it will go into the AC. Don't worry about that. And again, uh, we've used a 30 gauge needle which was potentially exactly the same size as the actual wound. Any excess you can cut, and then if you put some flow seam here, you will see that the leak is completely stopped. And you can put your bandage lens at the end. Okay. Again here, this is a patient post desec. You can see here there is a lot of wound leak and the AC was not taking the air at all. Every time we put the air from the side port, more air will leak from the main wound. You can see here the little air bubbles at the wound. So what we did is we put some extra sutures, still more leak, the more air you put, the more leak, so sutures didn't work. So then you after we did a paracentesis, always good to do that. Then you put the fibrin glue in the edge of your incision and a little bit in the periphery of the AC. And here you can see the glue is being put from the edge of the incision and into the peripheral part of the AC and then after that uh, uh, we inject the air into the AC and you will see that um, that it is completely you see the air in the AC is completely taken and you can also use the glue to to cover the conjunctiva Thank you. 
letting me anymore. I think I'm almost done. I've got maybe another three slides. Mm. Yes, right yeah? there. It's not letting me. So here also you can use it in managing of uh, leaking blebs. So also in a leaking bleb, you can inject fibrin glue uh, at the edge. So the take home message is that cyanoacrylate is uh, cheap, easy to store, not biodegradable. You have to remove it and you can use one for multiple patients, not a single patient. So you can store it in the fridge and reuse it, uh, but it's irritant. It will cause vascularization, so you can't leave it forever. And the fibrin glue is very versatile and it is biodegradable and uh, it's about 70 UK pounds per vial, but you can use it. You can put many cases on the list, three, four trigium cases and amniotic membrane and all, and you can use one to form many patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so any, any questions on corneal gluing or um, both soft fibrin glue? I know fibrin is expensive, but all these uh, indications are non well, we'll say off-label uses of fibrin glue, and uh, but they we published the paper and they are very versatile and in many difficult situations they come to your rescue. The uh, the application of fibrin glue and glaucoma surgeons, you know, leaking blebs, they inject autologous blood, and that is the same purpose. But if you have fibrin glue, it it can uh, seal the wound very nicely. Any questions for Dr. Sai? Yes. Yes, at the back there one. We we don't tend to uh, glue a dismatocele unless we are uh, almost 100% sure this is going to prefer. But I would use cyanoacrylate glue, not fibrin glue, because the fibrin glue does not cause uh, it, it, it's not, it will not give tectonic support, right? It will, it will be helpful to see like, you know, as I've showed you graphs and other things, but it won't give you any tectonic support. So for this metocele, I would use cyanoacrylate glue if it's starting to leak or it's impending leaking. Also, if you do with regard to desmetoceles, <laughs> it is important now a, a very clearly uh, defined difference in two types of desmetoceles. There are some with an OCT, you can show that the pre layer is intact. It is still bulging the, the desmetoceles, and those ones don't tend to perforate quickly, so they are not impending perforating risk. Where the ones which only desmus membrane is there, those are the ones which you might want to consider gluing. So you can, if you have an OCT, you can tell the difference very easily. Yes. There's one one question. No? Okay, yes. In using the uh, fibrin glue, do you find much difference between Alcon's Eversil versus the test seal? We only have the Tessil uh, glue in England, so that's the all my only uh, uh, experiences with the Tessil glue. Yeah. Uh, you, you do you think there should be a difference? found that I do get better adhesions with the Tresia when I use to seal. Yeah, it's quite it's good. We've never lost a graft from Tessil glue ever. So it's, it's very, very good actually when it means the risk adhesion saving. And sometimes I have to uh, enhance the uh, placement of the uh, grafts uh, with sutures, unfortunately, when I'm using the Everseal product. Mm -hmm. right. Well, when we do a wet lab, we'll we'll invite you to see how we do with the seal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we never get an issue with the seal. Uh, in fact, um, I, I think any fibrin glue should work equally well. There shouldn't be any reason it why one should work better than the other. My question is, uh, how does fibrin glue behave with the endothelium? You're saying you're putting it in the tract. Well, it does. See, it is just like fibrin, so it will dissolve. You know, it doesn't harm the it ha doesn't have any problem with the endothelium. It's transparent. After two, three days, you, you won't be able to see much. Just a little bit of inflammation as you would almost normally mm -hmm. see when you give you steroids and it works. Because you just need it there for a tiny amount of time for the epithelium to grow and bridge over that area of leaking and that usually takes 24 to 48 hours. 
see uh, so many clinical situations we get a fibrin clot in the anterior chamber this is exactly the same only it's a little more of it and it normal clot dissolves in four days this one takes about 10 or 12 days because of theaprotinin so it stays longer but otherwise it's pretty natural product from from human blood okay thank you very much uh, So what we'll do now is um, okay. If okay, yeah. So um, oh, well this is not what. Uh, let me just move on from there. So. Uh, Two slides on the suturing. Remember the question that was asked. So one of the things that's very important in when you do the suturing is to all the lines should appear one. It's a single line, as you can see over here. Um, there was one which was not. But if if it if you get a, a, a double contour for the line, then it's not uh, it's not right. But here all of them are single straight. If your line if feature pass is not right, you will find a black line coming like that then you know that's not right. So that's one point. Um, then uh, if you, and this is in the context of corneal graft, uh, the suture should be radial. You know, look at this suture here, look at this one, and look at this one going a different direction, different direction. Dif so when that's the case, then you know you've not placed them right. They should all be radial. But this is the point I was making. Now you've got your, you passed your suture and you've done your, your knot and you're about to bury it. What you look at is, the situation here with regard to the cut the needle has made in the stroma. If that cut is in the middle of your suture, it is very easy to turn it around. But often you will find it's not, it's like this. The closer your knot has to go to the corner of that cut, that's the needle width that has gone through, it'll catch. And then you have to move this to that side and then pass it in. So always try to move your suture to the middle of that cut and then pass it and goes in very easy. It can be like that. That is very difficult to put in. So all these things will happen. You just pause to investigate and examine where your needle width cut is compared to the suture. And you will find that will go, go in very easy. And it's so easy. I mean, there's a video to show you how I was doing that. It's not going. Just move it to a side and it'll go in. So moving on. Alcohol delamination of the corneal epithelium. So the idea came from LASIK. It's nothing new. Uh, you put alcohol, you take the epithelium off, it leaves behind a very smooth stromal bed. The smoother the stromal bed, the firmer the attachment of the new epithelium that grows and the less likely it is to come off. So apart from LASIK, are there any clinical other implica uh, indications for this? Now when you look at the sheet of cornea that you have, uh, epithelium that you have removed from LASIK, you will see that the alcohol cleaves at the level of the basement membrane over here. That's what it takes off. And if you look at the scanning electron micrograph, you will see multiple little holes develop, usually at the junction of three cells, these holes. And when you make a section of that, you will see that there are gaps between the cells. And if you look at the bottom surface of this epithelial sheet, there are little cracks between the basal cells. So it's like pouring water on a pile of stones. The water will go around the stones and make a, a, a pool or a puddle at the bottom of the pile. And that's what it does. Uh, and what it also does, it, this is the Bowman's zone or the Bowman's layer. And you can see how clearly and smoothly it leaves behind very nice surface. This is in high power. Of the cells that you take off with alcohol delamination, about 70 to 30% in that range are dead or alive, whichever way you want to look at it. So all the blue cells are the dead cells. The non-staining cells are the live cells. So you may have a lot of living cells or may have a, a fair amount of dead cells. So when you have a lot of living cells and you put the sheet back on the surface, it tends to stay live and attach. And this is the technique. You take a, a zone optical zone marker for cross-linking. There's a standard nine or 10 millimeter marker, but otherwise you can have your six, seven, eight millimeter. You place that on the area of the pathology that you're going to treat. We're not talking of LASIK or cross-linking now. We're talking about for clinical uses, uh, use of alcohol delamination. Then you put 20% alcohol for 30 seconds. After that, you suck it out with a swab and you peel that sheet off 
and you put it on a piece of paper and you use that for histological examination and, and I'll show you how important that is. So here it is uh, absolute alcohol which is 100%. You take it with a needle into a one mil syringe and then you take off the excess to the point, oh sorry, let me get this pen I'm using my, um, so you, you will take it to the point two mark on that and then you will suck water all the way to the one. So point two in, in one mil is 20%. You put it back and forth, uh, mix it in a trough, uh, like in a galley pot like that, and then you will suck it back in the syringe and you will leave it in, that, uh, in the syringe. If you leave it in the galley pot, the alcohol will evaporate and you'll only be left with water. So you do all of this and you make your uh, mixing before you prepare the patient. Now, when we are looking at recurrent coronal erosion syndrome, this is the, one of the most commonest and the most useful indication of this technique. You identify the area of po positive staining, which is green, and negative staining, which is where the epithelium has lifted off the uh, Bowman zone or the uh, above the basement membrane, but it is not torn. So it's not going to stain, but it's, it's going to show you this negative staining. And that's the whole area that you have to treat. And this is a, a little video. You dry the eye, you put your zone marker, and then with a little bit of pressure, on the cornea, not a lot, just a little bit of pressure. Then you put your 20% alcohol in it, uh, which you have prepared, and then you will uh, wait for um, 30 seconds, you will suck it out, and then you will wash it. If it spills, just give it a wash, dry and start again. But here we didn't, it didn't spill, so uh, a wash was not really necessary, but anyway, there you are. And now you can see how loose the epithelium is. It's wrinkling, just to demonstrate that. And then you take any instrument, a dry swab, a crescent blade, a hockey stick, anything and you can gently peel off the entire epithelium and it'll almost like a, a epithelial rexis it'll come up along the circumference of that mark that you have made and you can take it out then you wash it uh, wipe the bed a bit put some uh, bss and a bandage contact lens with some antibiotic drops uh, if you give them antibiotic drops you leave the bandage lens for two weeks and we take it out after two weeks and that is uh, something in the range of an 85% 80, success rate in recurrent coronal erosion syndrome, they'd get no more erosions ever. Uh, mm, and that, uh, that is uh, very, very useful. And it has other options. We have other options as well, like you can do diamond burr polishing, PPK, or anti-stromal puncture, but uh, this has uh, some advantages. So here's another example. This is how the patient looks from a diffuse view, negative positive staining, alcohol delamination, is another example. Some patients of recurrent coronary erosion, you don't see clinically anything until you look for it. And if you look for it and put fluorescein 2%, dilute it, wait a few seconds, let the tear film break up, and you will see very subtle intraepithelial microcysts. That is how they look. Some of them have burst causing positive staining, mostly they are negative, and that can cause excruciating pain and the whole uh, syndrome of recurrent erosion. So that's it after alcohol delamination. So what do you do with the sheet that you've taken out? That's very important. So you, on a piece of paper, you float it in BSS and you open it. And once you've opened it like that, doesn't matter it's up one way up or down, you can't tell. And then you will suck the water out with a swab so that the sheet settles flat on the paper. And when the sheet settles flat on the paper and you've dried the surrounding water, you bring your drop of um, glutaraldehyde or formalin or paraformaldehyde, whatever fixative you want to use for the purpose you're going to process that tissue for. The important thing is that it lies flat and it fixes flat. And it's, then you give it to your pathologist, they will give you beautiful histology with morphological orientation. If it's a clumped up bit of tissue, it's very difficult to tell which side up, which side down, which is the basal cell, which is the epithelial cell, causing a lot more problems in, 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 in um, interpretation. So here you can see in the recurrent coronal erosion syndrome, it is very uh, interesting to see that the hemidesmosomes are very, very abnormal. And underneath the basal cell, there's a lot of collagen debris. So here again, you can see uh, there's a uh, very dense collagenous debris. And even here, the hemidesmosomes appear normal, but they're not in the double line that we need are used to seeing in, in normal. And here they're completely fragmented. So there is a reason why these cells are not sticking 
because intervening between the basal epithelium and the stroma is this collagen debris, and your anchoring filaments cannot do go down and grab it on the on the uh, the anchoring plug. So uh, this alcohol delamination for recurrent urine is a very safe, effective alternative to other treatment modalities. There's no residual effect like scarring, which we s always see with anterior stromal puncture. And unlike PTK, it is inexpensive and does not induce a hyperopic shift. So in PTK, you are supposed to take about five to seven microns of the Bowman's layer. And if you do that once or twice, then you've gone quite a bit into the, the stroma. And if it is eccentric, you will create an irregularity on the surface. So you have to always align your PTK to the center of the cornea and do a large area to cover the area of the pathology. With, but with the delamination, you can go as eccentric as you want because you're not doing anything to the Bowman zone. And here, it, it gives you tissue for histological examination, as we will see. So that is the main indication, but that's not all. There are many other therapeutic indications and diagnostic indications, as you will see. Uh, intractable epitheliopathies and conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia and a few others. So here's a patient following a graph. The epithelium is heaped up. It is staining negative and positive. One week he comes, it's like this. Another time it's like this. Another time it's like this. Another time it's like this. And that is changing. And you think this is herpetic. You're treating it for herpes. It's not going away. So all you do is do alcohol delamination, take the lot off. It'll heal back, and you'll never see that lesion again. And that's exactly what we did for this patient. Here's basement membrane dystrophy, map dot fingerprint. It's usually eccentric. And if it is not in the visual axis and is not causing recurrent coronal erosion syndrome, you don't have to treat it. But if it's in the visual axis, it will cause alterations in vision. The quality of vision is poor. Then you do alcohol delamination. You take it off. And you can see over uh, here. Uh, and this was the other eye, the two eyes. And then uh, when you did al alcohol delamination, took the epithelium, you can see those map dots, are uh, those white dots are actually, you have um, basement membrane on the top, so this is duplication of the basement membrane at the bottom. Cells are trapped in between, and these cells are undergoing various stages of degradation and necrosis, and then they form those white dots in map dot fingerprint dystrophy. So this was a patient sent to me as dystrophy, uh, as saying some kind of corneal dystrophy. We said, no, this looks more sinister than that. This is probably a CIN. So what we did is alcohol delamination. Two things about the dystrophy. One is never diagnose a dystrophy by looking at one eye. You must always look at both eyes. Even if it's banned or obvious in the exams, you make the, uh, the um, uh, motion of looking at both eyes. You see lattice and granular straight away, you can tell. But you must look at the other and then say it's a dystrophy. So here. Uh, and, and then we treat it with mitomycin. And, and but I want to show you the histology. This is when you treat it the way I explained to you, and then the pathologist will give you this. And this is beautiful, flat epithelium right from the basal cell to the top. You can see the top cells look normal, squ normal squamous cells. But look at the bottom, multinucleated giant cells, all these signs of ATPF. The only dis disadvantage of alcohol delamination is it doesn't give you the stroma. So to diagnose, carcinoma or squamous carcinoma, so you have to look at penetration through the basement membrane into the underlying tissue. But you can't tell that because you don't have any underlying tissue when you do it by this technique. Uh, so here's another patient with a, a um, presumed herpetic eye disease, a non-healing area that never healed. So then we did alcohol delamination. It completely healed, leaving some subepithelial scars from the tissue. We could see a lot of ap apoptosis, marginalized marginization of the chromatin, as you see over here, and with some uh, intra-nuclear um, uh, inclusion bodies. And this was a very interesting situation. Limbitis with epitheliitis, inflammation, a lot of vascularization. Uh, we couldn't tell what's going on. Uh, we were trying to treat it for some infections, with usual you know, steroid antibiotics or m other things. It didn't go away. And then this would you would call a pseudodendrite or whatever. Um, so we said, okay, let's just take away all that abnormal tissue, which we did, and that's what it became. Just like that. So the medicines didn't work, so you take away all the abnormal tissue. So sometimes I call them intractable epitheliopathies of unknown etiology. You can make a big difference by then uh, using this. But this is something we recently published, very, very useful uh, indication for this technique. Granular dystrophy, when you have a patient whose vision is compromised, you do a penetrating graft or a deep anterior lamellar graft. 
but give it time a few years and the epithelopathy uh, and the dystrophy will come back in the in the in the in the tissue and when it comes back in the tissue what happens is that it is coming back mostly from the epithelium because the turnover of epithelium is very fast the keratocytes take a longer time to come back from the host and repopulate the, the donor keratocyte a uh, donor stoma so deep deposits of granular you do not get soon superficial deposits come very soon they all are in the epithelium as you can see confocal microscopy and in the alcohol delaminated epithelium lot of these crystals or these deposits of granular are in the epithelium and they work their way into the stoma so if you take away the epithelium before they get into the stroma the graft remains clear the new epithelium is clear it will last one or two years and then it will start to accumulate again and you can keep doing this and these are examples you see this is the dystrophy in recurrent in the epithelium alcohol delamination and we have the confocal and the histology here again same thing and it tends to deposit if you have a graft host junction there or these are arcuate incisions the, the material was and, and it and it clears up so we have i don't want you to actually read this slide but what we're trying to show is that see 11 years 9 years 10 years 15 years uh, 11 years so patients had up to four alcohol delaminations over 11 years not a single one so we have seven eyes from four patients not a single one needed a regraft so you can prevent regrafting in patients with recurrent dystrophy by doing alcohol delamination on a regular basis every two to three years a very useful indication and there are some other things like this is thigacins uh, we don't know what causes it you treat it with steroids it goes away they become steroid dependent you need long-term steroids but if you have a whole cluster in the visual axis instead of giving them long-term steroids you just do alcohol delamination and take the lot off so this is a confocal image of thigacins and interestingly again when we did alcohol delamination and took this off you can see there were some uh, in intranuclear and paranuclear vacillation intranuclear infusion bodies suggesting that it might be viral in origin so alcohol delamination is a simple outpatient procedure uh, it's inexpensive compared to eczema laser uh, ptk uh, it can be used effectively to treat a variety of corneal epithelial ocular surface disorders avoiding need for transplants in in recurrent granular and it is very useful as a diagnostic biopsy so you're getting tissue which you can fix properly and get a lot of information you can even use it for culture if you want or for pcr because you've got a whole big sheet of, of cells and we have not seen any long-term complications for any of these indications that we have used it for other than you know uh, there's about a 10 or 15 percent recurrence of uh, recurrent erosion uh, despite treatment with this and just one little pearl if you have a patient with recurrent corneal erosion that is not curable or treatable with any of the options you choose be it ptk or stroma puncture then think of herpes virus infection because occasionally you will find recurrent erosion in herpetic patients and it's actually the herpes that's causing it and we are, we are not thinking of that uh, and then you have to treat them with the antivirals and that helps so thank you very much so at this point i think um, we will conclude this part of the talk and then uh, Rashmi will come, us and, uh, come up and give us a talk on the amulet membrane. But any questions on alcohol delamination before we move on? Is it useful for, useful for filamentary keratitis? Uh, if there are a large number of them, it will um, get rid of them, but uh, it will not cure it because it's mostly dry eye related and again this is my observation um, it's not published anywhere filamentary keratitis you will see more associated with collagen vascular disorders not with any other type of dry eye uh, why that happens i don't know but it's quite strange uh, the problem is if you do that you will leave them with a large epithelial defect which may not heal because there's in the dry environment it will not heal so i have never tried it but i just go and physically pick out the filaments there and in herpes like you said there could be a confusion so would it be detrimental if you use it no it's, it's not detrimental only it doesn't work in fact uh, if it is frank herpetic lesions and or it's atypical herpetic epitheliopathy and you're not sure uh, the old classic treatment used to be debridement you know you take away that area of epithelium you take the virus load with it and it'll heal 
and that is exactly what you will do with this. So if anything, it will be beneficial, but the erosion s problem, you know, the severe pain on waking and all that won't go away and you have to then treat antiviral as well. Thank you. Any question? Okay, uh, Rashmi, you're all set. Right. So uh, just a little tip about when you're making the 20% um, alcohol, uh, you take it in the syringe, you the video stopped halfway, so you take out the air, up to 0.2 mark you put it, then you disconnect that needle because that needle is full of alcohol and it will become stronger. And then you suck your BSS or distilled water, it doesn't matter what, and you put it up to the, the one mark and then you've got your 20 and then you mix it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today I'm presenting on amniotic membrane transplant in ocular surface conditions. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Dua and uh, Dr. Saeed to give me this opportunity in this session. So to begin with uh, the composition of amniotic membrane, there are mainly three layers. One is the epithelium, the basement membrane, and the stroma. So the epithelium is the physiologically most active layer of the amniotic membrane because it produces a lot of growth factors and cytokines like epithelial growth factor and transforming growth factor alpha and interleukins like 6, 8, and 10, and also the tissue inhibitors of uh, metalloproteases. Uh, the basement membrane is composed of collagen, and the stroma has avascular collagen and stromal cells. Uh, the stroma is again divided into compact layer and fibroblastic layer and the spongy layer, which goes towards the chorion. Now coming to the mechanism of action, first of all it inhibits fibrosis, so it acts as an anti-adhesive. Then it promotes epithelialization because it uh, produces all the growth factors like the beta FGF, the HGF, epithelial growth factor and nerve growth factor. Uh, because it also produces factors like endostatin and thrombospondin 1, it inhibits vascularization. And it has antibacterial properties because uh, it produces bactericidin and lysozymes and lactoferrins as well. Now, just like any other bandage, uh, amniotic membrane also co can cover the wound and reduce pain and discomfort and also help in promotion of healing. That's why it is called as a biological bandage. It can be used as a basement membrane or substrate to facilitate the migration of epithelial cells, and that's why we can use them in non-healing epithelial defects. It has anti-inflammatory properties, and it d there is absence of HLA antigens on amniotic membrane, and that's why we never see any cases of rejection, even when we use amniotic membrane transplant from any donor. Matching is not required. Now, it is available as fresh, frozen, or freeze-dried or heat-dried. Uh, the frozen membrane is uh, usually stored in dimethyl sulfoxide and uh, phosphate buffered saline or it can also be uh, stored in Dalbeco's modified Eagle medium, which is the more commonly used medium. Uh, in Nottingham, we use uh, Omnigen, which is a vacuum dried uh, kind of um, amniotic membrane. It is available in different sizes, ranging from Omni Omnigen 80, which is a 10 millimeter disc, up to Omnigen 2000, which is a 50 millimeters disc. And if you see there, there is a blue colored eye uh, which shows the direction of the yeah. omnigen. So if the eye is looking towards the right side, that means the epithelial side is up and the stromal side is down. So that is how we recognize which side is up because the amniotic membrane otherwise is dry. If it is not a dry amniotic membrane, then there is a way of seeing which side is the stromal side. Sorry. Uh, wait, this, is um, this was supposed to be a video which unfortunately is not playing here. Oh, is it playing there? Sorry, I, c I can't see it here. Yeah, so uh, in this video, um, what is demonstrated is when we're, when we're pulling on the amniotic membrane, when we see strands like that, it means that that side, the sticky side is the stromal side. And if, uh, if it is the strands are not seen, that means it's the epithelial side. So why this is important is because uh, the amniotic membrane can be used either as a graft or a patch. When we, use as, uh, when, you, when we use it as a graft, the expectation is that the epithelium should grow over the amniotic membrane and it gets integrated into the substance. So that's why it's called as a graft. 
So in this case, the epithelial side will be up because that's where the epithelium has to grow. In uh, when we use it as a patch, that means the epithelial side should be down because in these cases, uh, it tamponades the migration of the inflammatory cells. So that is when we call it as a patch. Sometimes two membranes can be combined with one side in one membrane epithelial side being up and in the other one the epithelial side being down and sometimes multiple layers can also be used. This is an example of uh, amniotic membrane being used in multiple layers. There's a persistent epithelial defect which is cleared and the epithelium is removed uh, as seen in the second picture. A smaller amniotic membrane is first placed and on top of it a larger membrane is placed and then it is sutured to the corneal tissue. Now, cl uh, clinical applications of amniotic membrane, it can either be used for partial corneal cover, like in cases of persistent epithelial defects, or uh, for subtotal corneal cover, where a continuous suture is used to suture the cornea uh, in the peripheral region of the, uh, inside the limbus. For complete corneal cover, usually the conjunctiva around the limbus is peritomized, and the amniotic membrane is sutured to the peritomized conjunctiva. It can also be used to cover bulbar and fornicial areas and it can be used for total ocular surface as well. For total ocular surface, the conform a conformer can be used which is wrapped in amniotic membrane and then the conformer can be placed inside the eye. And for total corneal cover, sometimes uh, a contact lens called Prokira is available where the, uh, which has the amniotic membrane in the center and the rim sits on the limbus. Now coming to the indications and uses, uh, these are just some of the common indications for amniotic membrane but there are so many. So the first is the persistent epithelial defects. So this is an example of amniotic membrane being used in persistent epithelial defects. Uh, this was a case of PED and herpes zoster keratitis where the epithelium is just freshened and then a small layer of amniotic membrane is sutured at the edges. And after a few weeks, this is how it heals. So the epithelial defect is completely healed. Then again, this is a video where there's a persistent epithelial defect with symblepheron. It was a case of severe ligneous blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. The symblephora are released using crescent, and then um, amniotic membrane is used to cover the entire raw area. So we can also see that, that at the edges, the epithelium is reflected, and the excess epithelium is removed, and the margins are freshened. And then the amniotic membrane is spread over the entire raw area. And with the help of fibrin glue, the amniotic membrane is secured in place. Next uh, indication is uh, in bullous keratopathy. So again, this is a video showing use of amniotic membrane transplant in a case of uh, bullous keratopathy. So superficial marking is done first using a trephine. And then all the edematous and thickened epithelium is scraped off using a crescent blade and the cornea is cleared. I can't actually forward it from here, but uh, this is just showing uh, the removal of the entire epithelium, thickened epithelium. And then uh, these are small puncture marks which are made in the stoma. This helps in better adhesion of the amniotic membrane because the small stomal punctures help in migration of keratocytes, which finally help in um, incorporation of the am amniotic membrane to the bed. And this is how the omnigen is then placed. You can also use multiple layers if required. And then finally the epithelium uh, grows on top of the amniotic membrane. Next indication is pterygium surgery. Whenever conjunctiva, uh, conjunctiva is not available for a conjunctival graft, then amniotic membrane can be used, such as in cases of recurrent pterygium, etc. So this is a case where uh, there is a large and fleshy recurrent pterygium on the temporal side an amniotic membrane graft was done after pterygium excision and three months post-operative we can see that it has completely healed. Uh, it can also be used for conjunctival and symblepheron surgery. In the case of ligneous blepharoconjunctivitis, we saw how the symblephora were released and amniotic membrane was used to cover the fornices. Uh, even in cases of conjunctival granuloma, it can be used. Uh, in this picture, there is a conjunctival granuloma superotemporally in the fornicial area. And post-operatively, we can see that the inflammation is only at the edges of the amniotic membrane transplant and rest of it is quiet and healed completely. 
we can also use multiple layers of amniotic membrane or in stacks sometimes to build tissue in cases of corneal melts or thinning or small perforations. So this is a video of a total corneal PED in a case of acanthamoeba keratitis where there was loss of stromal tissue and corneal thinning. So multiple layers of amniotic membrane were placed. So initially we saw that all the epithelial uh, edges were freshened and excess epithelium was removed. Then the amniotic membrane is fashioned in such a way that it covers the epithelial defect completely. You can use curved scissors or straight scissors, whatever is convenient. And then using fibrin glue, the amniotic membrane can be placed one on top of the other in multiple layers. So this is fibrin glue being placed, thin and thick, uh, just as Dr. Saeed was showing us before. And the amniotic membrane is placed over the epithelial defect and just to make sure that uh, it reaches up to the margin. And then another layer of uh, fibrin glue is being placed for another layer of amniotic membrane. So in this way, multiple layers can be placed. And then in the end, a large uh, amniotic membrane is placed and sutured to the periphery to cover all the layers. And this is an example where amniotic membrane is used as stack. So pieces of amniotic membrane are used in uh, cases of stromal melt to build up the tissue. And then a larger layer is used to cover all these stacks and sutured to the cornea. Other common indications are infectious keratitis because as already mentioned, amniotic membrane has bactericidal properties. So because of that, it can be used in infections. It can also be used in association with uh, auto and allolimbal transplantation and also in cases of keratoprosthesis where the ocular surface is really bad. And a brief note about amniotic membrane transplant with limbal grafts. This is a technique which uh, Professor Dua has published. It's called as ASA. Uh, it stands for amnion, amnion assisted conjunctival epithelial redirection. And as the name suggests, the amniotic membrane is used to redirect the corneal and the conjunctival epithelium. So the surgery is done such that the conjunctival epithelium grows over the amniotic membrane and corneal epithelium grows under. And I'll just briefly tell you how it's done. So the first picture shows a clean cornea. In the second picture, we see that there is fibrovascular proliferation on the corneal surface. So in the third picture, there is a 360 degrees conjunctival peritomy done and all the fibrovascular tissue has been removed. Then from the donor cornea, around two clock hours of limbal tissue is harvested from superior and inferior areas and then it is sutured on the recipient uh, in the superior and inferior area. If after removal of the fibrovascular tissue, the stromal bed is rough, then a smaller amniotic membrane uh, graft is sutured in place there for the corneal epithelium to grow over it. But at the same time, the conjunctival epithelium can also start growing on the cornea. And to avoid this, a larger epithelial membrane is placed such that it covers the entire surface of cornea and is tugged under the conjunctiva, which has been peritonized so that when the conjunctival epithelium grows, it grows on this redirecting amniotic membrane. So this is an example of one such case which was treated. Inferiorly, the limbal graft is seen very clearly because of the two sutures. This picture shows that how there's no epithelium in the beginning, it's the amniotic membrane which is taking up all the stain, but uh, it heals well and there is epithelium growing on either side. Uh, from nasally and temporally on the amniotic membrane. And it's just a small epidefect which is left. Other than cornea and ocular surface, uh, amniotic membrane can also be used in glaucoma surgeries, uh, such as in filtering surgeries as an adjunct to reduce the scarring. And it has also been used to for repair of leaking blebs. It can also be used to cover valve implants and ex uh, exposed pericardium patches. In ocul oculoplastics, uh, we can use it in lit lit reconstructions and orbital surgeries and orbital implants. Then coming to the fate of what happens to the amniotic membrane, it either gets incorporated into the substrate of the host epithelium or it just disintegrates within a few weeks. Uh, it can also undergo necrosis or sometimes it just falls off. It cuts through the sutures and falls away. There are some complications which can be seen, uh, either partial success or failure, in which case repeat might be required. Premature sloughing or loss of uh, amniotic membrane can be seen. If there are multiple amniotic, membranes uh, amniotic membrane transplants done, then because of immune response, sometimes hypopion is seen, which is mostly sterile. 
and it deposits uh, on the amniotic membrane are common, which could be either drug deposits or calcium. And uh, transmission of, of infection has also been reported, especially HIV and hepatitis. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions for Rashmi on amniotic membrane? Yes. There's somebody there with them. Do you find any difference between uh, the wet and the dry amniotic membrane? In most of the papers that I have read, they say that the freshly uh, prepared amniotic membrane is the best to use. But uh, when it comes to dried amniotic membrane, whether it is freeze dried or heat dried or vacuum dried, I really don't have much experience with dried ones. Vacuum dried one is the only one which I have seen in Nottingham when I moved. But when I was doing my fellowship and everything, we've always used the freshly prepared amniotic membranes. So, so we, I think ha we have some experience with between both of them. The dry does not glue on the cornea well. It glues on the conjunctiva. And the wet is, uh, and sometimes also the dry will disintegrate quicker, but it is more transparent, so you'll be able to see epithelium growing underneath it. So that is one advantage. But usually, if you have got both, the, the, the fresh amnion works better, glues better on the cornea, but it's not available all the time. So sometimes you get a patient of Steven Johnson or whatever, and we need the amnion very quickly, so we just get off the shelf. And, and it works uh, when there is no infection and not a lot of inflammation. And the second question is about pterygium. Uh, do you find that uh, you get a m much more recurrence if you use amniotic membrane for pterygium? There has been uh, randomized control trials and has been a uh, Cochrane review on this, and it does show that recurrence with amniotic membrane is much higher. So we tend not to use amniotic membrane and use autoconjunctival graft whenever we can, but sometimes you've got a very big defect, especially if you have a diffuse steatoconjunctival proliferation or you've got uh, nasal and temporal teresians and you've not got enough conjunctiva to cover. So the way you can do that is that it's uh, been shown also in a paper recently published by Tseng Group that they put an amniotic membrane and they can put uh, small areas of autoconjunctiva on top of it so that not to uh, keep the amnion exposed. And the problem of having the amnion is that it is not epithelialized. So you will have still a raw area for a long time, so that will induce inflammation. And that's why it, I think, in my opinion, we're getting more recurrences when using amniotic membrane than when using autoconjunct graft, when you actually have epithelium covering the surface straight away. Thank you. Dried membranes, uh, they tend to disintegrate and dissolve quicker than the wet membranes. And also the dried membranes don't have the spongy layer of the amniotic membrane because that's been removed or desiccates out. And whatever, if you believe that there are useful growth factors that are in the spongy layer, then they will not be available. Uh, so we're not quite sure, uh, but we have we've experienced with both. And we found two things that Dahlia said. The dried men don't last as long and they don't stick so well to the cornea. So we've got little time and um, we, we started about 17 minutes late. So we're going to have that 17 minutes extra to finish both the talks, hopefully. Uh, so we're going to start off with sampling. Um, and this sampling is in the form of every you know, scrape or swab we do is a sample. Impression cytology is another modality and biopsy. And we've already talked about alcohol delamination. And what you do with these samples, you can do histology, you can do immunohistology, culture sensitivity, PCR, or other molecular studies. Uh, so if you have a, a corneal ulcer like that, uh, there are key things over here. Uh, the two points I want to make as, as, as a trainees for an exam, you will never ever culture the hypopion. You never put a needle in to aspirate the hypopion. It is usually sterile. It is usually in often occasionally in fungal keratitis, you have uh, live fungi going right through, but uh, not in bacterial. And you can use various little devices, swabs, sticks, needles, the chimera spatula, the flock swab. These will uh, pick up more bacteria and they release it better. This is some, a modern uh, device uh, to take the samples. And you will always take the sample from the edge of the ulcer. If the ulcer has got a serpiginous appearance, which means it's going more in one direction for a while, then it goes in another direction or from another site, you go to the site that is growing rather than anywhere else, 
to get your ch uh, maximum um, chances of uh, uh, a positive yield. You always liaise with your microbiologist, so wherever you are working, make a microbiologist your friend and show them some ulcers of patients and tell them, look, this is what we are sampling. We've got very little samples, help us with this. So what we have is we have a broth, we have some culture plates, we have uh, uh, five different culture, blood agar, chocolate agar, febroids, and we then uh, have a, a slide, and the whole, all that kit is stored in the fridge. So immediately before the culture, you will take it out to room temperature, let it warm, you will dis wipe out any discharge from the patient's side. You're not going to culture the discharge because all it has dead bacteria and a lot of inflammatory cells. You take the tissue or the material from the ulcer, from the coronal stoma. Then um, you scrape the edge, like I said, you spread it evenly on the glass slide and let it air dry. If you're looking for trophozoites of acanthamoeba, you have to fix it with alcohol straight away, other than trophozoites burst on drying, but otherwise air drying is good for most bacteria. And then you, uh, on, the, uh, on the sample, on the agar plates, you have to plate the sample in a shape. You give it a C, you give it a cross, you whatever you do it. The reason, why do we make the C, or, or we make a, a, a parallel line? The reason is that any bacteria growing in that C has come from the eye. Any bacteria which is a contaminant will be random in the plate. So if you give a shape, then you know that that's why you're looking. So that's why we make it in a certain pattern. And you never break the surface. The bacteria grow on the agar plate and give you the morphology of the colony. If you break the surface, it's in the agar, you're going to lose that completely. So very important uh, not to. And you can make a vigorous uh, swab of the cells uh, in case you're looking for, you need the cells in case you're looking for virus because they are intracellular. Uh, these are some of those examples. So uh, so this is what I said we can do with, with these. Uh, and, and you can take the samples with this technique called impression cytology. Uh, there are many applications of impression cyt cytology, but let me just show you the technique. You have these uh, filter paper discs that come with 0.45 micron size. It has a paper backing and it has the paper, uh, the actual filter paper. You take away the paper backing and then you hold it with the forceps and you can cut it in half and make a notch if you like, to know which is temporal, which is nasal. Here we are sampling the limbus. You can do that or you can sample the whole cornea if you want like that. And you put it on the surface you want to sample. Then it should be dry. Then you take a Goldman head of a uh, the you know the Goldman tonometer, it's a flat surface. You press this a little bit so that it sticks, and then after a few seconds, you gently peel it off. Uh, and then when you peel it off, you can elute the cells out, or you can stain them, and you can look at them in whichever way you want. Uh, so you can take all the cells out, and you can do even a fax analysis, which is a flow cytometer count the cells of a certain type by staining it, or you can do PCR. So here is this uh, one of my. Uh, fellows who came from Karachi, he became a model for impression cytology. So a drop of topical anesthesia to numb the surface, then let it dry. Remember the key word is dry. If you apply wet, then all the water soaks into your paper and none of the cells will attach. So then here we made it into a D shape and he's going to look down and we're going to sample his upper bulbar conjunctiva. So it has a, s a right surface and a wrong surface. You get the right surface on the cornea, uh, on the, on the uh, conjunctiva there. And then we will take this, uh, like I said, the, the head of a Goldman uh, tonometer and you gently press it because you want to make it drape around the curve of the bulb, not flat like that, drape it round, and then you press it, leave it for a few seconds, and then you gently hold the edge of the paper without holding the conjunctiva and you peel it back off. And if you find some resistance to peeling it, you know you're getting cells. If it comes off very easily, it means it was wet and no cells would be stuck to it. And then when you take it off like that, uh, usually if you put fluorescein stain, you will see that area will stain when you know you've got the cells. So this is how they will look. Now this is normal corneal epithelium. This is the corneal limbus. You can see how the limbus cells are very tightly packed and very different from the cornea. If you see goblet cells like here with the past PAS stain, then you know this is conjunctivalized epithelium on the cornea. So you can, uh, these are all impression cytology specimens. This was one where you had trachoma inclusion bodies uh, from the conjunctiva. Here you can see there are a lot of these uh, uh, goblet cells or mucin-producing cells, 
and, and here's one new thing producing cell. So you can stain them with different, so you get a flat layer of cells uh, and, and can get some uh, good information from this technique. Here is a confocal image of dendritic cells and here's a image of dendritic cells specially stained for in a sample of the conjunctiva um, uh, following inflammation. Again, with in, in patients with keratic conjunctiva, it's the sicta. Uh, you can look not only at the presence or absence and the number of the goblet cells, but also at the metaplasia, if any, in, in the morphology of the epithelial cells surrounding it. Uh, here is a Nelson, you see hardly any goblet cells you can see, and the cells are becoming flatter and larger and more, more, more like strain. And occasionally you see the snake-like chromatin, and this is what you can see in a patient with, uh, with uh, Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, like I said, you can do fax analysis. You put the cells down, and you can quantify numbers of cells, or you can do PCR for various, in this case, antimicrobial peptides expressed at the ocular surface. So a lot of advantage of impression cytology, but there are disadvantages. Uh, it provides information only of the sampled area. The yield of cells is inconsistent. Sometimes you get good, sometimes you get poor, and you only take the superficial layers. But we got around that by taking two or three impressions from the same site. So you take the two cells off, you go back to the same site, get another two, so you can work your way to the deeper cells. Um, and and the, the techniques require a lot of expertise and, and skill. So it's not straightforward. Uh, and then occasionally you can get a complication like this, where an old lady with a lot of lax conjunctiva, and while peeling it off, pull the blood vessels or you pick the conjunctiva in your forceps and you can cause a hemorrhage. Now, corneal biopsy, just to finish off the sampling, and some situations you don't know what's going on and you want to take a biopsy. So if it is epithelial, you can just take the epithelium off with delamination or with a forceps and you get tissue like here, a, a dendritic ulcer, you delaminate it, you can curative as well as you get the sample. But if you're doing the corneal stroma, you tend to take biopsy for histology, microbiology, and, and nowadays also PCR. So you can use a three millimeter skin biopsy punch and usually take a pair. Uh, we used to take pair, one for histology, one for microbiology. Now we try to divide one of them into two and send for PCR, or you can take three. And here where the first biopsy did not yield anything, we took two more. And here's another example of taking two biopsies from the patient uh, for the purpose, and here's how you would do it. Uh, remember that the, the instrument, the skin biopsy punch, is extremely sharp. So you don't press too much, but you have to have a cut all around, and then you can deepen it with a, uh, with a blade, or with a diamond blade, or just an ordinary 15 degree blade. You can deepen it, and then with a fine crescent blade, you just shave off the top. If it is very deep, the lesion in the stroma, then you make a flap of the superficial cornea, and then you make your biopsy and put the flap back on. So in these eyes, your aim is not to site restoration, your aim is to get a diagnosis and treat. And then site restoration procedures come secondary and that becomes a secondary objective. So, uh, so you can take the biopsy from where you are likely, most likely to get a good yield. Uh, don't try and avoid the visual access just because the patient's vision may be compromised, but you will then not get an, a diagnosis, and then you would probably lose sight anyway. So go for the sight, which is most likely to give you a, a, a positive result. And that's just how you take the biopsy. And then these are some examples here where you had a cantilever cyst inside the biopsy, or in the case of stem cell deficiency, there's a lot of goblet cells, multinucleated epithelium, uh, multilayered epithelium, and some intraepithelial lymphocytes right along the basal layer. So all these are features that tell you this is um, a, a, a stem cell deficiency case. So these are uh, just in a brief snapshot about a sampling of corneal tissue. So I'll quickly switch over now to corneal vascularization because that was the last bit we said we would cover in, um, in this uh, master class. Uh, so I will uh, skip through some of the principles uh, and then try and, and uh, em uh, emphasize in a little more detail the, the management. Um, so uh, in the process of vascularization, there has to be a stimulus, which is usually inflammation, you know, hypoxia, neoplasia, whatever. There's attraction of endothelial cells by a lot of chemicals, chemokines, uh, growth factors, etc. 
these attracted cells have to make their way into the cornea, they have to migrate. So to migrate, they have to degrade this compact tissue and they usually release or rely on metalloproteases or enzymes to make the passage. So if somebody's walking through a thick forest, you need something to cut the foliage as you walk, so exactly the same thing. And then once the cells have grown to where they have to grow, they have to adhere and they have to stabilize and then canalize to let the blood flow. So those are the stages in corneal vascularization. Now clinically, of course, we don't see much of this, but uh, in one analysis we did of 165 patients with multiple follow-up, uh, we looked at the corneal vascularization and we found that acanthamoeba is the least likely to cause vascularization, herpetic virus is the most likely, but there's a whole range of different things, including surgery, and contact lens hypoxia, which are common causes of corneal vascularization. Now, when you look at a vessel, you will find that these corneal vessels always grow in loops. There's an afferent and an efferent. The afferent is the artery, and the efferent the, the is the vein. Unlike in the nerves, when we say afferent is the optic nerve taking message from the periphery to the center, in the blood vessels, it's the opposite. The afferent is the artery, remember AA, and the efferent is the vein. They always grow in loops, and one loop you will find is thinner, and the other loop is thicker. So one's the afferent, one's the efferent. They might be associated with hemorrhages, which may be part of the process because hemorrhages attract macrophages. Macrophages bring VEGF. VEGF causes the vessels to grow. Uh, the important thing about these vessels when they are growing is they will appear and disappear as part of the natural process. So you have to bear that in mind when you're doing any study on corneal vascularization to know whether it is due to your treatment that is getting better or it is because of the natural process. So you can see over here a very different kind of appearance to the vessels than over here in the same eye over time. Uh, then the vessels will can have these feeder complexes, arteriovenous complex or the afferent efferent. So one of these supplying a whole network of arborized vessels. There's another one here and here. In this, you can sometimes see arteriovenous crossing changes, but that is just a point of interest, not of much clinical significance. So here again, you can see this large area of lipid keratopathy, one feeder afferent efferent complex, as you see over here. So that is something you can look for, note, because it makes treatment easier in these situations. Now, the other thing you will see clinically, vessels always follow planes, planes that you create, suture tract, incisional planes, and your lamellar plane. So you will see this in many, many situations. Here you can see the blood vessels are growing along suture tracts, and that collagen is somehow more vulnerable to metalloprotease digestion, and the, the vessels then grow through the suture tract. Even when there are no sutures and you remove all of them, two years later they get an infection, all the vessels will grow in the suture tract. Then if they reach the graft host junction, they go along the graft host junction. Again, the collagen is of wound healing collagen there, so came from a suture tract along the graft host junction, and, and then eventually it will get into the cornea. So here again you see prominent along the graft host junction. When you have lamellar keratoplasty, you see they'll come along a suture tract, they will dip inside, and now here you have a wide plane, so they fan out. So the appearance of the vessel is determined by the plane you have created. And the vessel morphology will change, and uh, uh, we're we seeing this change with more and more lamellar keratoplasty that we're doing, that the vessels are growing and taking on different <coughs> uh, shapes. And here's another one where they were growing in, in the plane. Uh, if the dissect uh, done in this patient got an infection here, and vessels are going right opposite on the other side. You can see here the vessels in the interface. So the interface allows the chemokines produced at one end to diffuse and attract vessels from the other much more easier than they would do in a normal cornea. So we, when we modify cornea tissue, the wound response also changes. Sutures are the most uh, important culprits for attracting blood vessels. A loose suture should be removed when you see it. Uh, or, or a broken suture should obviously be removed straight away. Many residents will say, the graft was done yesterday, there's one loose suture today, oh, I can't take it out, the graft was only done yesterday. No, it's doing no good, but for potential for great harm. It'll attract mucus, attract cells, risk rejection, risk infection. So loss of harm, no good at all. So take out the loose suture when you can. So you can see over here again, a lot of mucus attracted uh, to the loose stitch over here, and that's not of any use. 
Um, so what are the inducers of corneal vascularization? Inflammation, and like I said, uh, and this will come up again, herpetic disease, zostroocheritis, is the strongest inducer of corneal vascularization. Herpes infection. Uh, then you have, uh, over here again, these are all herpetic examples. Uh, this is uh, bacterial infection in a dark patient, you can see. So infection, again, in inducer of vascularization, patient got a lot of vessels, and but it was treated and it healed successfully. This patient gets very good vision with a contact lens, so she sort of tends to wear a contact lens a lot, and you can see the vessels going in with hypoxia all along the suture tract. So suture tract is a plane we have created again, just to demonstrate how vessels going along the suture tract. Uh, neoplasia, of course, very strong inducer of inflammation, and non-inducer of inflammation, I told you earlier, acantamoeba. In our series, acantamoeba infection on its own hardly ever caused any vascularization, but in mixed infections, it did. Here's another example of that. And uh, rejection, uh, so the rejection will induce vascularization, vascularization will induce rejection. So stromal rejection of a graft always occurs in the context of vascularization. And the other thing about vessels, which is very important, you should know, they follow the plane of pathology. If you have superficial keratitis, you tend to get superficial vessels. If it's stromal keratitis, you tend to get deep vessels. In the early stages, it's a very important clue as to where your inducer will be, whether it's infection or whatever else. And here are some deep vessels in herpetic eye disease. And this is, uh, of course, a, a side where we didn't cover pterygium or diffuse keratoconjunctival conjunctival proliferation, which is a fibrovascular tissue always on the eye and never in the eye. But the most important take home message here up in, in understanding vascularization is that they are not all the same. You can have active young vessels, very bright young vessels, a lot of them with a lot of tissue edema and sometimes infiltration down. Active young vessels. And then you can have active old vessels. So they're still circulating blood on the slit lamps. You can see the circulation, at least in the veins. There is some tissue edema and inflammation, and they are active old vessels. They can be partially regressed vessels that are circulating or non-circulating. So they're circulating with blood, but they're not leaking, and then some of them will leak lipid, and you get lipid keratopathy. So active young, active old, partially regressed, leaking lipid or not leaking lipid. And when they're leaking lipid, you get this uh, lipid keratopathy, and uh, they can be completely regressed. Then you get these ghost vessels. You see like this, these are the ghost vessels, white lines. But the thing about ghost vessels is when the stimulus comes back, they recanalize. So they're not like they're gone forever. They are capable of causing problems. And then there is this one we have called the mature vessels. The stimulus was there. The vessels came in. They did their job, but they never went away. They didn't regress. But how do you tell? Because there is no capillary network between these large vessels. They are very full of blood, but they are not they are not actually doing anything. They're just blood conduits because there is no capillary network. There is scar, there is no edema. These are the mature vessels. And why this is important, uh, I will tell you in a second, because this is another important point. Lipid keratopathy occurs predominantly in the context of blood vessels produced by herpes infection. Blood vessels produced by other causes are not so much associated with lipid keratopathy as are blood vessels associated with herpes zoster and herpes simplex. And those two are the commonest cause of vascularization, which is also what was borne out in the study. Both were statistically significant uh, observations. Uh, so why is it important to know whether a vessel is active, young, active, old, this, that, and the other? Because your anti-VEGF treatment will only work on active vessels, active one and active, active old one. They will not work on any of the other forms of vascularization. So if you think you've got a patient with a lot of mature blood vessels or uh, partially regressed vessels, and you're going to do a corner graft, you're giving anti-VEGF drop, you're wasting your time, or anti-VEGF injections. Only on active vessels will they work, as is the case in the choroid as well. So what are the, the sources, the limbus, conjunctiva, and iris? So here's them coming from the limbus in a uh, fibrovascular panel. Uh, most of the vessels come from the limbus, uh, uh, but uh, uh, some of them will come from the iris, as you can see over here, where there's a posterior sinicare. The vessels will go out, as you can see here again. A lot of vessels, so these vessels come in from the iris and then the sinai. So that's different. So how do we treat vessels? So this 
two or three little principles. One is inflammation causes vessels, so treat the inflammation, the vessel will go well. Therefore, steroids are still the most important modality of treating vascularization. They have immediate effect and a very good, strong effect. And you can use them topically, subconjunctivally. Uh, some people even use them intrastromally. And then you have your anti veges and you have the Erastin and the Lucentis and other ones that are coming. I've got uh, some experience with Lucentis and a lot with Erastin. But like I said, remember, they will not work on any kind of vessel except the active ones. Uh, and you can give them uh, the same dose as you give in, in, in for the uh, retina because that's the only one they will have you ready made in a syringe. It's a off license use or off label use of Erastin for corneal vessels. So nobody in our setup will make one for you. You use the one they make for intravitreal injections and use that in the quadrant where the vessels are subconjunctivally. Argon laser occlusion was once very popular method uh, and uh, you could target the blood vessels. The problem was that it would hit the veins because the circulation is sluggish uh, but and cause um, a lot of the laser light would go through the cornea and hit the iris. You got iris atrophy and corectopia and very little vessel occlusion. If you use some special uh, wavelength lasers like the yellow dye laser, it was uh, effective, but not as, as much as this technique, which we invented way back in, um, remember that's 2000, and it's called fine needle diatomy occlusion. It can be used intraoperatively, preoperatively, very useful for lipid keratopathy, but any modality of treatment you use, whether steroids or argon or fine needle data, this is the key principle. If the stimulus to vascularization is not eliminated, vessel will recanalize or wicker. So you have to treat the underlying cause as well as the vessel. So here is what we do in fine needle diatomy. You need a monopolar cautery, not a bipolar that you use to stop the vessel. This is monopolar, like your electrolysis. So one electrode is wrapped around the patient's leg or the abdomen or somewhere. The other electrode is in your hand and the current is flowing between the two electrodes. As soon as it enters the tissue, it generates heat and it, that's where the coagulation occurs. So we take a um, valley lab and we use it at the lowest setting possible. And then you take a 10 ohm monofilament nylon needle. It can be single arm or dozen arm. It doesn't matter. You pass it in the vicinity of the blood vessel. So that acts as the extension of your electrode. And then you touch it, uh, touch the needle with the with the uh, monopolar electrode and you s press the button or press the foot switch let the current pass and you will see it will produce a coagulum at the side and seal the vessel uh, so let me show you see this is this patient i showed you before with a stromal rejection and we've done this and we completely uh, occluded the vessels initially you see a lot of haze but then that disappears but here's a patient now not fit for glowing very very thick vessel so what happens is if you do a corneal graft, as we were going to do a hot one in this case, it will bleed a lot. There's a lot of blood in the AC. So you stop that first. And the way you do it is with this fine needle diatomy. You pass the needle along the vessel, and then you touch it with the tip, and you see that whiteness developing, the whole vessel is coagulated. And you can pass it further down. Here's another one over here, the vessel. You can pick it up. It has to be in the vicinity because the heat will generate around the vessel. You touch it with the monopolar in a very low setting. Before you start, you can check it on the conjunctiva and it will tell you whether it's working or not. And you can see over there, there is some collagen shrinkage, but it doesn't really affect the uh, eventual outcome because it, it, it remodels itself uh, over time in a, in, in a few weeks. So here's another one where there are many vessels that are coming readily. You can go tangentially with your needle and you, you're pushing the needle mid stroma depth. You come with your coax. Uh, uh, the tip of the bi uh, the monopolar quartry, and you can see how you generate that coagulum over there. All the vessels are uh, occluded, and you can go one, two, three, four passes, so you get a length of the vessel, not just the point, and even if it is radial you're coming, you can pass one radial here, another radial, th third radial, along the length of the vessel, and that's how you would get your uh, occ occlusion. Now look at this patient with the uh, uh, lipid keratopathy. That's the fibrovascular complex, or the, the sorry, the, the, the arteriovenous vascular complex that is feeding the lipid uh, 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 leakage, and you're getting lipid, lipid keratopathy. Uh, that's how the patient is. So then we do this fine needle diatomy. You can see cattle trucking, just as you see in obstructed vessels in the retina. You've seen cattle trucking means you have obstructed these vessels, and you give it time, and this, uh, this uh, deposit will disappear. 
Here's another example you can see of a patient uh, with the vessel and after the final diaphragmal occlusion. Here's one other example. This is this patient, same enhanced view, so many blood vessels. And you can see final diaphragm, a lot of intracornal hemorrhage. But then you can see when it all settles, all that has gone. All these vessels are gone. And now you do your graft, much higher chance of success. Uh, so it's very useful. But again, remember in the context of herpes eye disease, you can occasionally get localized ectasia or thinning. So here you can see a sudden little bubble appeared in the cornea. So already the tissue is quite necrotic, it is stoma in herpetic eye disease. If you occlude the blood vessel, there's a risk of thinning. Uh, Rashmi told us about use of amniotic membrane. If there is inflammation and the amniotic membrane is attracting, uh, uh, the, the, the inflammation is attracting um, vascularization, you can stick amniotic membrane over here like we did. It will calm the inflammation and the vessel will also regress as you see over here, there's scattered pucking in the vessels. So in summary, the principles are, if the stimulus of vascularization persists, any form of occlusion will be temporary and they can recanalize. Mature or partially regressed vessels are good candidates for fine needle diaphragmy or laser, but not for Avastin or Lucentis. Steroids are potent inhibitors. And then we have these other uh, anti-MMT uh, um, MMT inhibitors and the VEGF inhibitors we've seen uh, which are now being used. And our standard practice is now is to combine fine needle diaphragmy and the end of that we give Avastin injections because any stimulus for near neovascularization induced by your heat or your needle pass, we can stop that because that will be active vessels that are growing by the injection of Avastin. So that helps. Uh, these are just some other points which I've already made. So I'll conclude over here and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Professor Doom. <laughs> Any questions on uh, sampling or vascularization? We can take a couple of questions quickly. Yes, from here. Uh, sir, how will you treat a uh, herpes simplex of uh, recurrent corneal vascularization? So, uh, how do we treat it? We, we will. Um, the vascularization is mostly stromal, so you get on top of the infection first, and what we do is we give a cycloware, which is we have that, or Vergan, which is GAN cycloware. You give that in the normal dose, you know, five times a day for 10 days or two, or 10 days or two weeks, let it settle, let the active virus infection go. Then we give them 400 milligrams oral acycloware twice a day prophylaxis and start steroids. Uh, we never use steroids without antiviral cover, either orally or topically. And then we will, the steroids will help treat the vascularization. And particularly when you get stromal herpetic disease, that's where you get the vessels. You don't get uh, epithelial vessels with herpetic, and, and that will respond to steroids. In fact, stromal herpes itself responds because it's immune reaction, but we can activate virus infection. That's why the antiviral cover. And steroids usually are the mainstay. But if you've got many mature vessels like, like this, we will go ahead and do fine needle diaphragmy, but we will then plan the graft, if we are planning a graft much quicker rather than wait for a month or two because by then the thinning will happen and occlusion can occur. Okay. For uh, stromal herpes, uh, do you advise uh, local and uh, oral both simultaneously? Yes, because even if it is not due to active virus replication, even if it is not, because it might be, then it can still reactivate epithelial uh, uh, infection uh, if you use steroids without antiviral. Okay, one, one question at the uh, back. Uh, yeah. What about uh, your opinion about doing a peritomy and then doing a cautery uh, instead of the technique that you showed? Uh, peritomy, if the vessels are coming from the conjunctiva, but if they're coming from the limbus, they're usually a little more deeper and you will not get all of them. So what you want to do is um, get the vessels that are in the cornea. And if they are not from the conjunctiva, doing that is not going to stop them. I used to do in the past, even you know, in some cases, just nick the blood vessels with a fine needle, two or three points so that it'll clot. And that, that clot might stop 
uh, the circulation permanently, but it doesn't. After a while, they will recanalize because the stimulus has not been removed. So peritomy might work for very superficial vessels, but it might not work for the deep ones. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah. So what is your take on uh, OCT angiography to find out the vascularization of the cornea? Like, is it diagnosed? Uh, you diagnose it clinically or do you uh, advise? Yeah. You know, in my imaging uh, early days as a, um, as a registrar, senior registrar, and even as a consultant, I did a lot of rosin angiography of the cornea and sclera. And if you li look at the literature now, there are some people who advocate rosin angiography, and I suppose OCT might be just as good to try and tell out, uh, tell which is the afferent, which is the efferent, and the RC and the vein. But clinically, it makes absolutely no difference because you have to get the lot, and you can't selectively aim to get only the arteries or the afferents and not the efferents. They're so close, you occlude uh, with any of these modality, it'll, it'll get both. So you might as well just treat both. Now, sometimes lymphatics might be seen with, uh, uh, with some of these uh, dye techniques, which you won't otherwise see, and that'll give you a better picture of what's going on, uh, but even the lymphatics will be occluded by your fine needle diatomy because it is physically coagulating tissue, which whichever happens to be in its vicinity. So from a research tool point of view, very interesting and will give you information, but from a clinical practical point of view, it makes no difference. Thank you very much. And that will conclude this session. And I think there's lunch now. Thank you for your Thank you all.